doing it. Oh, we're doing it. Okay, well, there you go. <laughs> if you want to turn your videos off, please do so now. Um, and with that, welcome everybody to today's session. I will hand over to um, Patricia, who's going to remind us of what exciting things we're doing here. Welcome, welcome everyone. Thank you, Ismail, for doing the introduction. Welcome folks to week 12 already. Uh, we're quite close to the end of this cohort already. Um, this week's topic for the cohort call is Open Science Garden uh, number three. So this uh, because open science has so many aspects um, that we want you to learn about. It's split across um, three different calls. This is the last one in this uh, series. And today you will uh, learn about open data from Esther, um, open access from Godwin, and potentially open educational resources. I'm like still confirming that in the back end if we have a speaker for that. And um, uh, as, as uh, always, you'll have some time to reflect and uh, discuss amongst yourselves um, uh, as well. So that's why we ask you to indicate which breakout rooms you want to be in because you will um, get to be interactive. So um, with further, without uh, any, any more waffling from my end, um, I'll kick us off um, by handing over to our first speaker on open data. Esther, are you um, ready to start sharing and um, introducing the topic of open data to this wonderful audience. Yeah, can you hear and see the slides? So can you hear the yes. slides? Maybe okay. Yes, we can hear the slides. <laughs> Thank you. Great, I'm so happy to kick you off. And um, I have obviously adhered to the Open Science Garden team by putting as many leaves in this presentation as possible. Um, I'll be introducing open data to you, uh, but before we do that, I'm just going to highlight who I am. So my name is Esther Plomp. I'm a data steward at the Delft University of Technology. I am also a member of several open science communities, such as ISOARC, Turing Way, Open Research Calendar. Uh, so if you have any questions about that, uh, feel free to ask away at some point. Uh, but we're really here to hear more about open data. So first, to start off, what actually is open data? And I define open data according to the definitions of the Open Data Handbook and the World Bank. And the definition they use is that open data is made freely available for use and reuse by anyone and everyone. And what that practically means is that it needs to be accessible or available on the internet on demand. It needs to be able, uh, open to participation. So everyone should be able to reuse um, and redistribute. This also comes with some sense of transparency. Uh, there needs to be some information about the data collection uh, generation because otherwise it will be difficult to reuse the data. And uh, for in order to actually reuse it, you also need to provide it under terms that allow this reuse and redistribution. And I'll go into that a bit later in terms of what licenses are. Uh, then it's also important that this is interoperable uh, with either other data or that machine uh, that machines can actually read the data. So that's open data. And also, what is not open data? And that is data will be available upon request, because that is just a sentence, that's not the actual data. Uh, and that is a sentence that a lot of people are still using in their publications at the end of the publications, uh, where they basically say, trust me, uh, I have done a good job, uh, but you can't actually see that I did a good job. And um, we have several publications, several studies on this, where they 
tested if data is indeed available upon request and they contacted authors and then authors either did not respond or were not sure where the data was so uh, this was <laughs> not uh, it's these studies are not great so to say uh, and one of them basically concluded very harshly that research data cannot be reliably preserved by individual researchers which is just a, a bam how should we do that then? How should we ensure that data is actually open and available? And for this, uh, we have something which is called the FAIR principles, which means findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. And then you still don't know what that practically means, but findable very briefly means that you're sharing the data in a data repository uh, with metadata, so information about the data, and the persistent identifier. And the persistent identifier you should now already be familiar with because I shared the slides uh, with a persistent identifier in the chat. So that's what a persistent identifier looks like. Uh, then it should also be accessible. And in my opinion, you should first decide what can be shared. Not all data can be publicly shared. Uh, personal data, uh, anything data related that could harm individuals or sites, artifacts, look anything harmful should not be shared obviously uh, i think that falls under accessible and uh, if you do decide that it can be shared you can also share it on the restricted access as long as you ensure that there is an access procedure in place it doesn't mean that the data has to be open so i am putting in uh, an is not equal to open there for a reason because sometimes people confuse fair uh, data with being open data but that's not actually the case. Um, if there's an access barrier in place that people can uh, follow up on, it can still be fair, but it doesn't necessarily have to be open. So hopefully that, that distinction between the two is clear. Um, for interoperable, what I mean there uh, is that you can use open or common formats and languages within your research discipline to ensure that you would be able to combine data sets or at least interpret uh, each other's data set because you're using common terminology. It also helps if you use consistent vocabulary or terminology. And what is even better is something which is called metadata standards, uh, when you really follow standardized practices, because that will make it easier to integrate different data sets. Uh, that doesn't mean every discipline has a metadata standard, because that is actually quite a community uh, intensive process where the whole or at least the majority of the community needs to agree upon how they structure data, which is, um, yes, an intensive process. And not every community is going through that or wants to go through that. Uh, so that's interoperable. Then for reusable, it's important to apply a license to data, uh, which specifies how others can reuse the data. And the same goes for software, actually. So I'll go into that in a bit. Uh, but also documentation, so any any information about the data to make it uh, more clear what the it, what the data is about, how it's been collected, so that uh, people can retrace your steps. And then I've pasted some links in the slides where you can find more information about the FAIR principles. So how do we do uh, FAIR? Um, basically, if you share your data in a data repository, you're almost uh, there, so to say. You do need to work on some of your documentation because data repositories are not going to do uh, extensive documentation for you, but they provide you with this persistent identifier, uh, long-term storage, any uh, access procedures that you want to put in place. And I've listed some examples of repositories that um, allow you to do that. Uh, one of them is Sonodo, so that's the repository that I use to share the slides. It's a more general repository, and so I used it to share the slides, but you can use it for data, code, reports, training materials, anything that you can fit into a 50 gigabyte upload. And then there's also Figshare, for example, also a general repository, but allows you a little bit less space. And then there's plenty of more data repositories, which you can find via fair sharing or retreat data. If you type in some keywords that you would normally use, if you look up other people's research, uh, then you might actually find a data repository for your own discipline. Uh, and I think this is really the solution to preserving data and providing access to it. 
because then we just make the data repositories responsible for long-term preservation and access to the data instead of having to do this ourselves. So I think data repositories really save us a lot of headaches in the long run. Then I mentioned that I would be going a little bit into licenses. Uh, so that's very important for data as well as software. And for example, for this presentation, I have chosen a CC BY license, uh, which means that you can take anything from uh, this presentation and you can just reuse it, redistribute whatever way you like, as long as you cite the original presentation. And in this figure, you can see um, which license places more, more or less restrictions upon reuse. And so, for example, um, this image itself is licensed under CC BY SA, which is share alike. Uh, so it is a little bit different from uh, CC BY. It means that this particular image needs to be shared under the same license, which is also why I have pointed out separately that this picture is licensed differently. Uh, because if you reuse this one, then you need to share it also under the CC BY SA license. So that's a little bit of the difference. You can go over the licenses by, uh, if you click on the overview provided by Creative Commons, which is a, a very, fairly widely used way of licenses for data. And they also provide you with a license chooser. So that is hopefully getting you to the license that you want more quickly, because I realize that this is a, a, a pile of uh, letters which do not seem very clear. And for software, if you think data is a pile of letters, then software is also uh, a bit complicated. But it's important to get through these things because it is really important to make your data and software available under a license because otherwise people cannot actually reuse it. So I hope you can take the time uh, and read through some of the licenses to decide which one matches with your preferences. Um, then uh, I think, the FAIR principles are fairly technical. I've got attacked on that for on Mastodon for saying that. Um, but I would also like to open this discussion up to what is actually open data uh, with these two quotes. And one of them is, there is no open science if science is not open to all, uh, by Kirsty Whitaker and Olivia Guest. And this quote from the Open Science Beyond Access book, which uh, is saying that we should include more ways of knowing and understanding uh, our common world with within the great scientific conversation because it would enrich and diversify its collective ideas and creativity for the common good. So that's a bit more. Um, we should just not just put our data out there, but also be more conscious about who we include in our research and who we include in discussions in making data available. And for this, we also have some principles. Uh, which are called the CARE principles. And these facilitate indigenous control in data governance, and they promote equitable participation in data governance and reuse. And um, they are primarily um, designed with indigenous communities uh, at the center. But I really think that this really applies to any population or community that you work with. Uh, these principles are very important uh, to ensure that your research is more ethical. And FAIR does not really um, discuss that. Uh, the community and ethical aspect is not covered by FAIR. So care is very important. Um, there's also, for example, the data equity framework by We All Counts. And um, I really find uh, this panel on data justice talk story, uh, what Western societies can learn from indigenous uh, knowledge, really insightful. So I would just like to leave you with that. And I would also like to leave you with some additional resources, um, a presentation by Paula Andrea Martinez uh, on the same topic, open data, but then from a previous cohort, mentioned that we have a research data alliance uh, where you, which you can join. It's a global community that's working on uh, bridging or not building the social and technical bridges to enable open sharing of data. I knew there was a bridge somewhere, uh, but Research Data Alliance open uh, for people to join. Uh, have a look at the Turing Way, which you've probably already heard about, uh, but that's 
uh, great research to learn more about open and reproducible ethical and inclusive data science. I've included a link uh, to some more information about licenses because I realized that that is very um, intense to look at all the letters and, and all of the text. So I tried to clarify that a little bit more. And two blogs on uh, 10 arguments against open science that you can win and how can you make your research data more accessible. So feel, please do check that out. And I think that's all I wanted to mention on open data. So thanks very much for listening. Thank you so much for a great presentation. Um, there are all the claps for you, all the applause. Um, just making sure everyone's connected to audio. Yes, we are. Um, I'll open up the, the room is open now. Do you have any comments or questions you'd like to, to, to send Esther's way? Um, just raise your hand or leave your question in the chat or in the etherpad. So on line 100, exactly, uh, we can add questions. Just to get the ball rolling, although we only have five minutes for questions, I do wonder, Esther, if you have any examples of two open projects, but which have different licenses. As in just in general, two open projects or two open projects working together, just... In general, I, it, it would, I'd be curious to know if you, if you have the rationale for two different projects to have different licenses. Like they're both open, but why might they have different licenses? If you don't have any, that's also fine. I don't have any particular examples of projects that use non-commercial licenses, but I know that a lot of people in open science uh, have very strong feelings about commercial profit from any of their outputs. So that could, for example, be a reason to choose a more restricting license to restrict commercial reuse. Um, I don't have an example from the top of my heart, but yeah, some people just feel very strongly about that. Gotcha. So people need to read through the read through the. Uh, um, thank you, Yo. Non-commercial book. Do you want to take a moment to share what, what that is? It's but you've very... you written, so I understand. <laughs> it's a very weird example of that book. is a book about the history of free software. It's licensed CC by non-commercial, which is great. Uh, but it at some point has separately also been licensed for sale. And so if anyone saw me getting angry about a book that was for sale in PDF form for £136, that's the book um, because it is legal to dual license things, <laughs> despite the fact that it also has non-commercial on it. Um, and that's not the author's fault. It's very important for me to state that. And he wasn't even consulted about this. It was just something the publisher did. And and thank you, Yo and Esther, to that other question. Would you like to share your answer for the room, not only in, in text? Yes, I'm just trying to clarify in the chat uh, what rights. So why should uh, people make their research outputs available and whether I had, um, had to use any arguments to actually convince people to do that? Um, that's actually my daily job as a data steward. Yeah, that's, that happens a lot where I have to talk to people uh, and try to convince them to make it available. Uh, there are several arguments for that. In, at my faculty, I find that the funder tells you to do so is, is the strongest argument. Uh, then the second one is we have a policy on this, so you should be doing this anyway, is another strong argument. Uh, but actually also a lot of people um, respond to more intrinsic motivations, such as you share your data, you could increase your own citations, your visibility of all of your research outputs. Um, you could... Um, set yourself up for collaborations because people can already see the data, they know what you're up to, it's easier to connect, to ask you questions, collaborate with you on, on things. Um, so there's a lot, also a lot of people that agree that if 
people are paying for this with public money, then they should get the best value out of it as possible. Um, and then shared data um, is, I think, a valuable way of sharing it to get the most out of it so that people can reuse it, etc. cetera. Uh, so there's several reasons why to make it available. And perhaps I should be including a slide of that in my presentation. But I assumed that, that I was going to be preaching to the choir about that here. So that's why I didn't include the slide. But it is a very good question. Any final questions before we go to, um, I think Patricia's introducing the next section. Okay, we've gone quiet. Thank you, Esther, for great presentation and for answering those questions. Um, yeah, and for, for working so hard in this area. Thank you. And, and for fighting the, the good fights, of course. Thank um, you. Patricia, over to you. Yeah, and I already kind of uh, got into the, the topic area of like wider open access and, you know, licenses aren't only important if we talk about uh, data, but also about like other publications and other research outputs. Um, so I'm to say that we do have uh, another speaker um up from one of the like big open access publishers that are trying to do something slightly different and i trying to be um dis disruptive in that area which uh, i highly welcome um and yeah i'm gonna hand over to to Godwins. I'm not gonna try like to pronounce more of your name because that's gonna end up like butchering, but please do uh introduce yourself uh, uh properly um better than than uh I did. Um so yeah, over to you if you're ready to to share and talk. Thank you. And um thanks for inviting me. I think Thanks to Esther for starting off because that actually has put some shed some light, better light into what I was going to talk about. Um, my name is Godwin Omochakwa, and I'm uh, head of communities. Can you hear me all right? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, at e life. Um, as Esther mentioned, I thought you know this would be preaching to the choir, so I have, and, and also there's only ten minutes, so. Uh, open access is quite a big, uh, open access is a very big topic. So I've decided that I'm going to be very brief. And I'll, I'll jump in and say, due to a last minute change in schedule, if you want to go over the 10 minutes, that's okay. <laughs> if you want to make it to 15, if that helps, right. go for I it. I will take my time then. Um, <laughs> that's fine. Um, yeah. Okay. Thanks. Thanks for that. So I thought, um, I was also going to preach the choir, but I would be mindful of that, that, you know, we are learning every time and not everywhere. So these are the sort of uh, headings that I plan to cover, the open access in general, the incarnations of it, um, and whether there's downside or disadvantages, uh, the future of open access, and the rise of preprints, of course. But as um, Patricia said, um, what we at eLife are doing to contribute to this, so open access, as you know, is very broad. Um, it covers almost everything. But the core part of it is that there is an absence of um, financial, legal, or other barriers to it. So this is what open access means in general for publications. When they, when you have a publication, um, everyone is trying to, you know run around it one way or the other um, by putting certain conditions there and then. But whether that is working is something we can look at. In general, the, the name doesn't actually always match the description. Um, you get open access, but most of the time it's not open. Or what I'll say, it's slightly open, not wide agile. Um, there's always caveat in the process. 
and some of the open assets are not always easily accessible. So they might be open, but then the access part is not there. And once you go through the open, you may find that there's a lot of hoops to jump to get to anything. These are some of the inclinations. I'm sure that there will be others that I don't know about, but the gold, the green, the diamond, and by the way, this is not the order of the level of you know accessibility to them. It's just, you know, I don't know who invented it. It goes from colors to other things, but that is what you get. Um, I, I used to say think that because it's called diamond, it's the topmost. It's as open as anything, but it's not. Apparently, gold is the most or the less restrictive open access. And you have the green, you have the hybrid. Because I thought I have um, a few minutes, I haven't gone into trying to explain all of this. But as I said, gold is the highest part, um, type of open access. It simply means yes, very, very um, few restrictions to accepting them. Um, in eLife, we do say we are gold simply because we have an APC. A fully open access should not have cost limits. Like that is something that has not been achieved. Hopefully it should be in the next few years because of the changes that are coming in. But for now, where we are in the world of um, publishing, gold is the best we can do. You can barely get anyone not charging for something. And then there's diamond, there's green, there's hybrid. The one I want to point, point, um, point out actually is the black open access. I don't know if anyone has encountered Sci-Hop before. Um, here, if you have, that is um, the one that you say is when you say disruption. I think um, Patricia would rather say we are radical, not disruptive. <laughs> um, Sci-Hub is actually very disruptive. They take publications and they put block, um, dump it on their web on their website, and anyone can access it. So that is wholly open access. But the problem is there's a lot of illegal aspect to it, and Sci-Hub is constantly being chased to being sued here and there. Um, I actually haven't checked if they are still there, but I'm sure they, will, they are somehow in a different form. And um, as earlier mentioned as well, the downside or disadvantage for me, I do think there is no um, disadvantage in having publications open, openly accessible. But um, those restrictions that are added to them create some you know, um, regression on moving forward and publishers themselves who come up with the different types of open access and um, their, their argument really there's disadvantage for profits. And that is where the problem of open anything, the open movement has a problem because most of the publications or publishers are commercial. Um, unlike us, the reason in eLife we charge very little APC is because we are um, backed by funders so it's, it's, um, there, is re, there is room to be able to um, publish articles at very low cost with funders back in this. And the future, well, I think open access is inevitable now. Um, it's going to happen at some point, it will, because there is this movement. Um, I, I think one thing I didn't put here is what has happened in Indonesia where the Indonesian government has done quite a lot. Um, but because it's not a Western country, we don't hear much about it, but open access is quite big in Indonesia and they've done a lot about that. Um, but the coalition S, which um, is mostly focused in Europe, and then the current or the most recent one by the US. So with all these movements and things changing, I do hope that eventually we'll get to a point where governments can be standing up and saying, well, because we fund most of this, it has to totally be open, as we saw in the Nelson memo. Um, but regardless of where these are today, the system is still very slow and expensive. And because of that, it's also very inequitable. And that is one of the biggest um, um, downsides of not having full open access. Um, with the explanation given earlier about FAIR, um, you find that sometimes <clears throat> people who contributed to a work are not even acknowledged, let alone being able to assess it. So there's a problem with the equity around open access or science in general, open science or open anything. But preprint has 
increase the risk to open access. Uh, with the COVID pandemic, we saw that there's more activity, more engagements, and more um, participation in posting preprints. And that has helped a lot to push for um, access to various um, research outputs. Um, by posting preprints, people are able to put their work out there, put the data out there, and there is more to have them to come through that. But with that, it, it has challenged the system a lot and has pushed a lot of publishers to rethink what they do. You know, the days where your uh, research has to be hidden and no, no, I shall ever see it until three or four people decide that it is right to be out there. Those days are nearly getting behind us, you know, because I can think of very few research and um, publishers these days who don't consider preprint in one way or the other. That's the way, you know. Is that they create an, another form of a journal under their brand, just to say, well, under that journal, we can say preprint. But everyone is beginning to rethink what they do. So the movement is heading to, to the right direction. But what have we done as a publisher to contribute to this? Um, as mentioned earlier, we've changed the way we, you know, since 2001 in Eli, um, every submission had to be put in the public space through preprint. Um, using the public publish review curate system, we now ensure that both the review and the um, article itself, the research outputs are all out there. And it gives other people um, the ability to be able to contribute to that research work, help the researchers and the authors to firm up their work. And that brought us to what we did this year to change how we publish articles. Um, we no longer do the uh, desk triage of rejecting stuff. You submit article. The only reason that may not be uh, reviewed is if it doesn't meet uh, the criteria of falling under what we um, publish as the publisher. Obviously, you get a lot of questions of people saying, well, why can't my article be published? But, you know, we are not a big journal per se. We have our limits, but at the same time, it means that we have certain areas that we have to focus on and not do everything. But generally, for those who fall under what we do, half of that is not just this, it's that when you submit your article, it's also a preprint. Um, it's in the open, anyone can review it. We review the article, that is also in the open. Um, you can see all the reviews, you can see all the data on that article. Everything is frankly open and it's the author who then decides whether that article is finally made a version of record. That is the way we do it these days. And that means that instead of also trying to say, well, you know, this and that, the, the article is given is, we take it through a system where we uh, assign it a, a final summary, an assessment, so that we can tell you whether your article is a landmark um, um, research study or not, or whatever condition it meets. So this model provides some expert public review and assessment for preprints and promotes scientist evaluation, you know, based on what you have researched, not where you have published it. And this is what our, um, our final output looks like these days. Uh, at the very top, you see that it's um, made very clear that this is a reviewed preprint. It doesn't become a published article, if I use that term, until the author decide that this final assessment is what they want to make, make a version of record. But at first, it's put on um, a live um, website as a reviewed preprint. Um, the article review history is also displayed, so there's nothing hidden. If it's been reviewed twice, it will be made open there on the website. Can my mouse work? Yeah, so I don't know if you can see where my cursor is, so that's how I'm going. Um, it also sh shows you the reviews, so you have the peer review over here. You can read all the reviews on that article. So. The article is published alongside all the reviews. 
and below there you have a summary assessment of what eLife thinks. So for this particular one, it says it's important. So there's grading system we use. And after that, the author can decide, well, I want this to be made a version of record. So we increase open, not just by saying, well, everything is open. It's also about participation. It's about who has a voice, who is contributing, who says what happens about this um, items of science and research. But we also on the side have uh, this new platform called Society, which helps um, scholars to um, curate and collect um, research articles and share what they are reading with others. But what, what we see from this is to enable every researcher to be able to have an opinion and share that opinion, a constructive one, to be fair, on the outputs that are coming from their peers. So with some um, with a platform like Society, you are also participating in reviewing articles so that those reviews are open or, com or comments that you make. So this is a platform that we think contribute to the open access. Like I said, for us, open access is not, it's not just about, oh, well, come to our website, you can read the article and that's the end. There should be participation from all areas. And that means the reviews, the evaluations, whatever is happening should be out in the open. Anyone can take part. So this is how society looks at the moment. So most of the time on site, you find a lot of um, scientists come together and they just pick up um, preprints that um, other researchers have posted and they review them and they post them out. And it's been, uh, the, the benefits is, is very obvious. You get sometimes that authors respond to those um, reviews and say, well, thank you for doing this. And it helps them to firm up their work more and more and strengthen it. So that activity is contributing to the whole open access system. And I do say and think that um just echo what um, Esther finished with that, you know, something is not open up open access until all the aspects of that research is available for everyone to take and do something useful with them. So I will end it there. And uh, thank you for listening. Thank you. That was an excellent presentation. Thank you so much. Um, there you go, a round of applause. Thank you, everyone. Um, Okay, so we have a couple of questions already in the etherpad, but you know, where everyone is welcome to write up more questions, put things in the chat, or raise your hand if you want to be, um, if you want to ask live. Um, so I'll read the first question. Could you please elaborate a bit about the focus not being on the where of a paper? What do you mean by where? Do you mean uh, the institution, the university, the country? Where? Um, as scientists, you know that the there are some um, some focus sometimes on who publishes the paper. That is where the where comes in. Um, sometimes you finish a piece of work, you you queue up because you want a certain publisher to do it. And you want a certain publisher because you're looking at things like impact factors. You're thinking about um, the prestige you might get your work. Um, and that is linked to, of course, for the employment grants and all of that. So we're thinking that that actually takes away the value of the work because it focuses on just the material aspect of it. And, and you see that most scientists are publishing one thing after another every time, but nobody's paying attention. So what we're saying that it's not about where you publish, it's about what the piece of work is. And this is why we change the assessment to narrate it in a way to say that this work is very useful or it has added something new. So that's what the where and, and what is. Have I answered the Thank answer you. I'll, I'll, whoever wrote that question, if you want to raise your hand now, now's your chance. Otherwise, I think it was a very thorough answer, if, if that helps at all. 
Okay. Um, thank you uh, for that. And the, the next question is, um, what is the relationship between society, which you introduced and pre-review? Um, which you introduced? Sorry? Sorry, can you repeat the last part of the question? What is the... Relationship between society, which you introduced, and pre-review? I see, yes, thank you. Yeah, actually we worked very closely with pre-review. Pre-review started out as a group that tried to enable open reviews. And if you go on site, you find pre-review is also a group on site. But as pre-review develops, um, what it has done very well is to provide a platform for individual reviewers. You can review directly on pre-review. On site, however, um, site is an aggregator. You don't, you cannot, or you do not review directly on site. You can annotate any work, um, and then if you link in, link into site, that work will be shown there. What we have done with site is to say that we don't want to um, bring, you know, I don't know, gobble everything in. Site works with preprints and servers, with hypotheses, with other review um, um, softwares, so that we can continue to all contribute something and everyone is credited. Instead of saying, well, you have to post your preprint to society, you have to write your, your review on society, you have to do everything. No, it's, it decentralizes all of this, but pulling them all together. Um, on society also, what happens is that mostly there are groups of people who has a name and there is, and also there are journals as well as, as societies. So they do their work, they review their work, and they showcase it on site. We pull them together, you can read those, and you can read more than one review, like reviews from modern, from multiple groups on one article. So they are pulled together, whether they are written on Hypothesis or on Kotahi or with Google Form, whatever, you can read all of that on that particular work. So that's the difference. Thank you so much again. Very thorough for me, but the person who asked the question, do you have any follow-ups? Did that, did that respond to your doubts? Actually, to, 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 on, make, you believe, to make you believe me, um, I started out as a community engagement manager on site um, when, when, he he uh, when he was first invented. So that's where I joined this crazy industry from. And before mm -hmm. I moved to my new role um, less than a year ago. Amazing, thank you. And I, I do want to just say uh, for people to actually reach out to you, you've introduced obviously something very interesting. If you want people to be able to reach you, I know you shared your email at the end of your slides, but there's also a section under the open access publication in the etherpad where if you want to share um a link to your website or socials or contact or anything at all um so that the OLS community here today um can reach out if they have any follow-ups that's up to you thanks I would do otherwise thank you another final round of applause and I'm handing off to Patricia again thank you Thank you, Ismail. Thank you, our speakers. Uh, I think that was a, a very good introduction to uh, both open data and open access publication. Uh, even I learned things and I uh, I sometimes have the feeling because I've been doing this for like 10 years, I know everything. So it's, uh, you know, good to stay humble and um, be reminded that there are new developments uh, in this area all the time and uh, you never have all the knowledge so um, if you feel that you know this is this is a lot in a complicated field it is and even us experts who are uh, have been doing this for quite a while um, don't always manage to keep up with all the developments so um thank you both uh, for really really good um um talks um 
we it looks like we do not have our third speaker for the session which means we do have um quite a bit of time to go into breakouts which is nice because um that gives you time to to um, process and reflect with each other um if anyone here hasn't indicated yet if they want to be assigned to a written or a spoken breakout room please uh, do so now so um Ismail can uh, do magic in the background and get you into the right breakout rooms and Esther also just um, put a plug in into the chat about the touring way um, which is where the beautiful um, background come, picture comes from um, and generally has uh, you know chapters on most of the topics that we're covering in in open science I would say um, uh, with some uh, nice illustration by Scriberia um, which if you uh, want to go out and preach to your colleagues uh, after this call uh, it might be a, a, a nice uh, source um, nice resource to to dig into and um, yeah, as I highlighted, uh, um, the chapter in the Turing Way on open educational resources, um, which is what would have been the third topic um, today. But yeah, while while I'm rambling, trying to get back to the point, um, uh, uh, I think uh, Ismail's thump up, thump up. Oh thumbs up means uh, there are breakout rooms now so in your breakout rooms uh, really it's space for you to reflect on all the things about open science you have learned so far and people are popping up already no well you have prompts in the ether pad and um Sorry. you know longer than longer than indicated because you don't have another speaker so Let's give people 15 to sure, 20 we'll, minutes. I'll, I'll broadcast a message in a moment saying 15. We can do that. Um, right. And yeah, just hope you have good and, discussions, good reflections wherever you end up with people coming back. Yeah, I did. I did just mess up a moment in a, in a like, what do I do? Yeah, we'll, we'll send people off in 30 seconds to it. So that's 15 minutes. Okay, super. It will be amazing. Thank you all uh, for coming back. Um, sometimes people disappear. Um, I'm glad you came back. I want to ask. We'll go. I'll I'll go to the um, written rooms first, and I will um, actually ask the written rooms. You've taken lots of notes, which I don't want to read now in like two seconds. I will take far too long. Would you like to add one more bullet point uh, just with a really quick summary of what you think is worth sharing out? Whilst you do that, and if you don't, that's fine. I'll, I'll try and read quickly. Um, Spoken room uh, one, would you like, do you have someone you've assigned to share out? So that was with uh, Jeffsia, Godwins, Saule and Bath. Yeah, no, we didn't decide, uh, but Saule, if you want. No, we didn't, but I want to uh, thank my speakers, uh, past Jeffsia and Godwins. It was a great conversation. I would say what Godwins does is really inspiring, and I'm really happy to meet uh, Paz and Jeffsia as well and learn more about them. I, I, I like that. If if nothing else, you feel inspired from one another. Um, Godwins, you're not muted. Is there something you would like to share? <laughs> Sorry, I didn't know I wasn't muted. And when I, I was noticed muted, the stuff you learned. And when I was muted, I didn't know I was not unmuted. Um, no, I, I I think I echo what um Salim just said. Uh, it was very good. It was such an um, uh, Paz is a good interviewer. Um, I recommend her for 
conference one-to-one um, -one sessions, you know, interviewing people on stage. She just draws it out. So thank you. And Sally, you made a very great contribution about it. practice, actually practical things that the rest of us don't do. So that was very helpful to see. Amazing. Thank you. I, I, I won't put any more pressure. I'm sorry. If I thank you. And I'll learn how to unmute and mute myself. <laughs> Thank I would maybe just add that um, okay. about one of the prompts, um, and I think Godwin is, and yeah, kind of emphasize something that is, we're often not uh, either advocate or practitioner. Often the two things collide or are part of, of, yeah, we often do both in, in so many ways. You see, it's different, difficult to differentiate um, when you're an advocate or, or practitioner of open science. That's all. Thank you. Yeah, it's a, it's a tricky, tricky distinction. Um, and I'll go to uh, Spoken Room 2. So that was Danny Esther, Lester, uh, Lessa, sorry, and um, Emmanuel. Would, did one of you assign yourselves? Are you brave enough to speak up? Oh, and and here the distinguishing factor is that Esther actually has the camera on, so I'm I'm looking at your screen, obviously. But Danny is also unmuting, so if, if you oh there wanna, you go, if Danny. you want to do it, then please go ahead. Otherwise, I can do it. Oh yeah, uh, yeah, I'll I'll speak for a moment, I guess. But just that we met each other and shared some stories about open science, um, like how we uh, have interacted with it in the past. Um, well, I learned about this uh, book dash from the Turing way, and uh, I was explaining how the, it would have helped me a lot when I was going through grad school if I learned the open science buffet approach, just being able to choose what you need from this community and not being too dogmatic or focused about pushing that through, maybe preserve some relationships I had in grad school. And uh, we talked a little bit about, oh, maybe like, uh, what's the risk of open science and how there's the risk of replicating inequality because you know EPCs still exist, um, and and then maybe a little talk about just what to do masters or PhD work in open science. And we weren't really sure uh, what programs exist, but when we offered some thoughts about um, masters of library science, perhaps uh, or maybe some sociological studies. And um, yeah, that's that's what I took away. It was also nice to meet everyone. And uh, yeah, to chat. <laughs> Lovely, thank you. Um, and 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 yeah, the question of the ethics of, of making things open is massive. Um, I'm just looking through the chat. Um, do, 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 do. And um, let me just sorry. Um, Nikki says, is advocate one of the parts of the self assessment at the start of OLS? Um, and, and, and applauding Danny's points. Thank you. Um, and I'll go to the etherpad and very quickly, what on earth could I read in two seconds? Um, uh, again, you have lots of notes and I think I'm, I'm going to say, go back to the notes. You have the etherpad, it's available. You can always um, see what your colleagues across breakout rooms uh, what your peers across breakout rooms thought and discussed. Um, and yes, I have nothing to add. I think I'll, oh, go on, sorry. Yes, I see a hand up. Go for it. Um, thank you. Hi, uh, oh. this is Petra. Yeah, we're in the uh, breakout room two with Laura, Patricia and uh, Akin. I got to learn a lot. Um, Patricia was sharing that friends between actually advocating and practicing open science. And but in the room, three of us practice, and Akin was okay, fine, he's advocating, but he's surely looking into practicing. So it was really an interesting session. And <laughs> Laura had to leave earlier, but I don't know if she's back yet. But yeah, we actually learned a lot. Thank you. Good, thank you. Um, thank you. Sorry, um, Emmanuel, I did just um, mute you because there was a beeping sound coming through. Um, 
Okay, uh, last chance. Does anybody from, just in case, does anybody from the other written room want to raise their hand? If not, it's over to Patricia to close today today's session. Go for it, Patricia. Thank you. Thank you, Ismail, for co-facilitating. And thanks again to the speakers and to you all for uh, engaging with uh, open science and discussing and reflecting. And um, yeah, it's really interesting to hear what came up. Uh, in terms of what's next uh, in the OLS, in this OLS cohort, um, we don't have any assignments uh, left. Uh, the only assignment left to do is getting ready for your graduation. So uh, if you're not entirely sure what that entails, check on Slack because PASS has um, put together a, a little guide to make sure, you know, you uh, uh, have a reminder, a little checklist um, for you to make sure you've done everything and are good to go. Um, next week, uh, is week 13 where you're uh, scheduled to meet your mentor again and uh, we do have a skill up call happening um, on the topic of self-care which is uh, one of my favorite uh, topics in the whole or less they um, uh, uh, schedule and I especially like it because of um, self-care was part a core part of this before it got cool everywhere else to talk about well-being and um, things so uh, I encourage you to um, attend that skill up call if you can make it and um, in week 14 we do have uh, an ally skills call which I think uh, is where you meet Esther again if you manage to join that um and she will facilitate that one. Um, but yeah, um, that's it from us. Uh, if you don't have any questions, uh, if, if we do have anything, um, you know, feel free to put things in the etherpad or follow up with us on Slack. And with that, I officially close the recording. <laughs>